I'm not too good with the computer. Um, my name is Mike uh, Brumel. I'm an elder at uh, JICF, for those that don't know me. Um, we're trying to get everybody to use their name tags, by the way. Um, that's why I have mine. Um, I normally forget, but uh, for people that are coming new to church and also for those of us that are getting old and forget names, we hope you'll uh, put your name tag on uh, next Sunday if you didn't do so this Sunday. So thank you. Um, we've been um, going through a series in the book of Ephesians. Um, for those that aren't familiar with the book, um, it's actually a letter written by the Apostle Paul who uh, was writing to the church in Ephesus, which is in modern-day Turkey. Um, Paul had been a very religious Jew. He was uh, actually uh, very zealous um, to fight against the Jews that had decided to follow Jesus as the Messiah. And um, he was on the road to Damascus trying to arrest uh, Jews that were following Jesus as a Messiah, and Jesus appeared to him. He had a conversion experience. He uh, ended up becoming um, the person that wrote the most books in the New Testament, um, and very zealous, um, especially reaching those that weren't of Jewish background that were Gentiles. So this morning, uh, we're going to be looking at Ephesians uh, chapter 4, verses 1 through uh, 16, and uh, continuing on um, with the book. Um, I've given the title, um, kind of a summary of, of this particular portion of Scripture, um, In Unity, Through Diversity, Toward Maturity. In Unity, Through Diversity, Toward Maturity. And I've summarized it in this sentence. Um, I call it the, the biblical big idea of the passage, or BBI, we say, <laughs> biblical big idea. Um, as fellow members of God's family, we should strive for unity while recognizing that Christ has given us different gifts, which we are to use to serve others until we grow in unity and become mature like Christ. Now let's uh, go ahead and read the passage. Um, I will read it for us, and uh, then we'll dive into it. This is what the Apostle Paul says to the church in Ephesus. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry and building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we were to grow up in every way to him who is the head, into Christ, 
from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Let's open with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your scripture. We thank you for the guidance that it gives us. We certainly sense as we read this the passion that the Apostle Paul had for unity within the church. Not only unity, but that um, he wanted those in the church to use their gifts to serve each other. And his ultimate goal was that we might be mature like Christ. Father, I pray that as we listen to your word this morning, and as I preach it, that we might be convicted of the role that we play. We might examine ourselves to see what we are doing or not doing to maintain unity, to use our gifts, and to help each other become mature like your son. You might motivate us so that we could do as you have asked us to do, to serve each other and speak to each other in love. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Let me just get a glass of water. One of the things that I like to do before we, we launch into the passage is help give you a little bit of a sense of the background to this. Um, we've talked about it a little bit, but it's a good thing to remind us of why it was so important for the Apostle Paul that people remained united. It didn't come naturally. And in a church where you have many people from many different backgrounds, um, it doesn't happen easily. Just to refresh your memory, right before Jesus ascended into heaven, after 40 days of walking around the earth after his resurrection, Jesus commanded the disciples, he says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, these folks weren't, weren't too bothered, I don't think, when they said, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea, although they might have been fearful of the Jewish leaders that were living in Jerusalem. But <clears throat> Jerusalem and Judea was the land of Israel. That was their home country. The people that lived there believed like they believed. <clears throat> and I think... All of a sudden, when Jesus said, and Samaria, they probably started getting a little afraid <laughs> because they didn't like the Samaritans. They didn't really care for them. You may remember the story of the Good Samaritan. Typically, the Jews would walk around Samaria so they wouldn't have to encounter Samarians. And Jesus is now saying, you're going to go into a group of people that are different than you. These were the people in Samaria did not have the same religious belief as the people in Judea. Um, they had been taken into captivity into Assyria. A lot of them intermarried, and they came back. And even today, there's, there are some people in Samaria that have a little different uh, religious belief than the Jews, even some different uh, biblical books. And then when he, Jesus said, and you're going to go to the ends of the earth, they would have understood that that was to nations far away. They would probably be having to go and be witnesses in places where the Gentiles lived. And again, that was probably not something that they were that comfortable with. It was a very different culture for them. They, they didn't like the Jews. I mean, they didn't like the Gentiles, I should say. They were afraid of the Gentiles. They, they were not allowed to even eat in the home of a Gentile. And all of a sudden, what was happening is Jesus said, you're going to go out and you're going to be my witnesses. And the implication was that they would become believers and followers of Christ, and they would be together in one body, the church. But I think that even the, the Jewish, I mean, even the apostles at that point probably didn't quite get it. Just to give you an idea 
of some of the challenges they face. This is a, a map. It shows the various countries where the people at the day of Pentecost came from. And you see, even though they were all in Jerusalem together in the day of Pentecost, we see that these people are coming from many different countries. They would come three times a year um, to uh, Jerusalem, um, the Jews would, and they would have a, a celebration of various festivals throughout the year. And you see, even though they were all Jewish, they came from different countries. Usually, also, the, for the countries that are not, not Judea, not Jerusalem, the people probably spoke Greek because that was, they were living in, in Greek-speaking uh, countries. Whereas the Jews that were living in Judea and Jerusalem probably spoke Aramaic, so the language was a, was a little bit different. And what we read is in Acts chapter 6, we started to have problems <laughs> because of the fact that people were coming from different countries into one church in Jerusalem. There was a, there was a dispute the, the church in Jerusalem was feeding widows, apparently. And the Jews, whose widows were speaking, that they were the Hellenists, they were the Greek-speaking ones, their widows were being discriminated against by the Hebrews, the people that were, the Jews that were speaking, speaking Aramaic, that were typically from Jerusalem and Judea. And there was an argument, a complaint. And the apostles had to resolve this by they appointed certain people to resolve this dispute, this discrimination within the church. There was, there was another situation where the Philip, uh, the apostle Philip, went to Samaria and people received the Holy Spirit. And they were, the apostles were amazed that even the Samaritans were receiving the Holy Spirit and coming to follow Christ. It shouldn't have been a shock because Jesus said, you'll be my witnesses in Samaria, but nonetheless, they were so shocked. And then an angel appeared to the apostle Peter and said, I want you to go to this Gentile named Cornelius. And when he goes to Cornelius, he says this to Cornelius. He, says, he said to them, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or visit anyone of another nation. It was not appropriate for a Jew to go into the house of a Gentile. And in fact, when Peter, they, they, the people in Cornelius' household became believers, they received the Holy Spirit, and then when Peter went back to Jerusalem to report on what happened, there were people within the church they were the, the circumcision party. They were the ones that said that if you want to follow Christ, you have to become a Jew. It says the circumcision party criticized him, Peter, saying, you went into the uh, uncircumcised men and ate with them. How dare you eat with a Gentile? This is the kind of discrimination there was that people were facing. If you were a Gentile... In this church in Jerusalem, you were probably not well accepted. This passage we're looking at is talking about unity, and there's a lot of reasons why we may not have unity. Ethnicity, even in a country like Indonesia, there's different ethnic groups. There's the Chinese, there's the Bataks, there's the... You know, on and on and on. So many, different national, so many different ethnicities within one country and within this church. Many nationalities in this church. I was just thinking, if, if I look around, I see Indonesians, I see Singaporeans, I see Indians, I see Japanese, I see... Ethiopians, I see Sudanese, I see Iranians, I see Afghans. <laughs> it's a very diverse church, this church. And because of our different nationalities, it's easy for us to not treat each other with the respect that we should have. Not only because of ethnicity, nationality, gender, socioeconomic status, some people here 
don't have jobs. Some people here own companies. Language, different ab abilities to speak, different languages. And even within churches, th different denominations that are split over issues that aren't so important. And that's one of the nice things I think about being in a majority Muslim country is Christians um, are forced basically to meet together. We come from a lot of different denominations, a lot of different backgrounds. Um, and to me, it's kind of refreshing, actually. <laughs> it's, it's good because it challenges us as we look at Scripture. We're not um, talking in an echo chamber. We're talking to other people that may believe differently. Um, not in the important part of Scripture, but in things that aren't as important. That's the early church. This is also JICF. We have these differences. They're challenges that we need to overcome and that Paul needed to be sure that the church in Ephesus overcome, overcame. As, as uh, Peter is speaking to Cornelius and as he's, he's about to leave, he finally comes to the realization that God wanted him to have. He says, then Peter began to speak. He says, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Everyone, regardless of our differences, we have something in common. And we not, need to be sure not to show favoritism. And I think that was a problem apparently within the church in Ephesus, that he needed to address. So let's look at the passage, and let's walk through it with that um, background, with that foundation. Paul says in the letter, I therefore a prisoner for the Lord. Um, the first comment he's making is he's a prisoner, apparently in Rome. And the reason he was in Rome be is because the Jewish people in Jerusalem thought he had brought a Gentile into the temple, which they were very upset with because the Gentiles were not supposed to go into uh, most of the temple, except the, the court of the Gentiles. They thought he had brought this Gentile in there. There was a riot. He was arrested, and eventually he, was, uh, he appealed and ended up in Rome. So he was actually kind of a victim of this lack of uh, favoritism. Within the, among the Jews. He says, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Now, what is he referring to when he says, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called? Well, if you remember in Ephesians 1, it talks there about those of us that are believers having been adopted into God's family with God as our Father. It also says that in chapter 3, it talks about the fact that because of that adoption into the, God's family, we become heirs. In other words, we, have, we will receive an inheritance because of our adoption into God's family. And Jesus talks about that inheritance in Matthew 25. He talks about the fact that he, on the day of judgment, it talks about Jesus being the judge, and he says to those on his right, he says, um, inherit the kingdom that God has promised since the foundation of the world. We will inherit God's kingdom, and I think what that means is we will inherit the right to live in God's kingdom. We have eternal life. Those that don't inherit the kingdom, by the way, it says cursed are you to go into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels? When we die, one of those two things is going to happen. We'll either inherit God's kingdom, or we will be cursed, <laughs> go to the eternal fire that was prepared for the devil and his angels. We need to make that choice. But here he's talking to the people that have already 
made that choice, that have been adopted into God's family, that have the right to that inheritance. I'm the oldest of, of 13 grandkids. Um, I have eight um, cousins. From, uh, went from my dad's sister, and then uh, uh, the others are from uh, uh, my dad's uh, uh, brothers. Two of the eight cousins were adopted. They were, um, they were Hispanic, of Hispanic descent. They were um, children of an unwed mother. Who the mother didn't want the children, and they were adopted into my aunt's family because she wasn't able to have children. And because of that adoption, they were brought into a family that loved them, and they also ended up having a right to an inheritance that they received when my grandfather died and also when my uh, aunt passed away. It's like what's happened to us. You know, we've been, um, we were formerly slaves to sin. God chose us. He, out of slavery, he adopted us into his family, and he's given us an inheritance. And now we're part of one family. We're all brothers and sisters together in one family. Because of that, because of that calling that we've received, we need to act in a certain way. If you're adopted into somebody's family, hope you, hopefully you don't cause problems in the family into which you've been adopted. <laughs> hopefully you'll maintain harmony in that family. And that's exactly what Paul says. In order to maintain harmony and retain, in order to maintain unity in the family, there were certain things that Paul was encouraging the Ephesians to do. He says they were to act with all humility they were to act with gentleness. They were to be patient. They were to bear with one another in love. They were to be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. The NIV translate the last phrase. It says, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. Do everything possible to maintain the unity. That unity doesn't come naturally. It requires an effort. Those, those things were quite important. There's another letter written to the church in Colossae, Col Colossians, that were, it was written about the same time as the book of Ephesians. And I noticed that Paul says the same thing to the church in Colossae. He uses those same four words. He talks about you need to be humble, humility, meekness, which is the same Greek word as gentleness. They were to be patient. They were to bear with one another. The fact that he's, he's repeated that shows how important those uh, things are. I was thinking through what those things are, because not just to read over it, but to really think about it. Humility is where we don't think we have all the answers. We don't insist upon doing things our way. We're not proud. We don't think we have a monopoly on the truth. We're willing to learn. I know in, in my business, the biggest concern I have is an employee who is proud. <laughs> because that means that they're not teachable. That means they're not going to grow. That means they're going to cause problems because they insist upon things their way. Humility is very important if we want to uh, keep and maintain um, unity within the church. Gentleness. The opposite of that I was thinking would be harshness. We're harsh with people. We don't say things in a kind way, in a nice way. Patience versus impatience. Are we patient with people? One of the things that I value the most is time, because I feel like I don't have a lot of time. I'm very busy with many different things, and I have a tendency to be impatient, 
because I want things done and I want them done quickly. And I get frustrated if things aren't done quickly. Forbearance, it means bearing with one another. That's where there's things that people do. It's not that they've committed a sin. It's just little things that they do that irritate you. One of the, the things that irritates me, it's kind of an embarrassing uh, admission, is the way people put toilet paper on a toilet paper roll. In my view, the toilet paper should come over the top, not under the bottom. <laughs> okay? Because it's tough to find if it comes under the bottom, right? Now, so when I sit down at a toilet and there's a paper roll and it comes out from under the bottom, it just like irritates me. It's like, who did this? <laughs> and if, I, if I'm at my parents' place and I go back uh, over the Christmas holidays and somebody in my family's done it the other way around, I take it out and I change it around <laughs> because it irritates me. <laughs> okay? But those are little things. It's not a sin. It's just irritations. We're, and, and I can tell you, because we're coming from so many different cultures, so many different countries, it's, that's going to happen. It's not that somebody's done something wrong. Every, every culture is different. And I, I've got to bear with that. I've just got to kind of bite my tongue and just live with it and say, well, God's made us all different. Okay? Um, and I'm sure that's true in a marriage. Also, you're coming from different cultures. Even though you come from the same country, the same ethnicity, you're going to have these issues because in your, your family you did a certain thing, a certain way, and then your wife is doing a certain thing in a certain way in her family, and you come together, and there's, you just have to learn to get along with each other. You have to bear with each other. And I've, I've realized that when I was, I was thinking through, okay, which one do I have the biggest problem with? And I thought, actually, I think I have a problem with all of them. <laughs> all of them, you know? Um, and sometimes I'm not even aware of it. But, like, at, at, again, at, at my office sometimes, it's like I've, I've recognized I have a meeting with someone, and somebody starts explaining something to me, and they're kind of going around in circles. And it's like, sometimes I've said, okay, okay just, can you just real quickly get to the point of what you're trying to say? <laughs> I get impatient. And that happens within the church, too. As you're serving in the church or working, it's easy to be impatient with people, to demand that people do it your way. And I think that um, that's something that all of us need to, to be careful of. We need to be humble. We need to be gentle. We need to be patient. We need to demonstrate forbearance if we want to maintain unity within the church. I think in general, everything on the left-hand side is you're being an other-centered person, whereas on the right side, you're being self-centered. And you may remember in Philippians, it talks about Jesus um, being considering others more important than himself. And that's the way we need to act if we want to keep unity within the church. And then... Paul continues on just focusing on the things we have in common. We're part of one body. One body not being the physical body, but being the body of Christ, which is the spiritual body, with Jesus as the head of the body of Christ, the church. That's funny. My Spotify just turned on. Who knows why? <laughs> um, sometimes Siri does that. I don't know why. Um, but anyway, uh, we're, we're part of one body of Christ. We're part of one spirit. We all have the same Holy Spirit. We have one hope. What is that hope? Of Christ's return and our ability to live with him forever in his kingdom. One Lord, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. We have one faith. And we've, we've, by the way, we've just mentioned we have one set of beliefs, the basic beliefs. We've talked about maybe at 
communion next time, we, we read the Apostles' Creed or Nicene Creed, so we're reminded of what that one faith is, the basics of the faith. One baptism. Now, I know Christians across the world, some do sprinkling, some do immersion. I don't think it's talking about physical uh, baptism necessarily. It's talking about the fact when we are baptized, it talks in the New Testament about us identifying with um, Christ's death, because we're dying to sin. It talks about Christ's burial, and it talks about Christ's resurrection. We've died to our old way of life, we're buried, and we've risen to a new life. I think that's the, what it's referring to, that kind of identification with, with Christ and being, becoming a baptized into the body of Christ. And then, of course, we have one God and Father. We have the same God, same Father, and there is one God who's over all, uh, through all, and in all. So he's focusing on the oneness. And again, we need to be doing everything individually possible to maintain that oneness. We need to be humble. We need to be gentle. We need to be patient. We need to be forbearing. Now, another way we maintain that unity is how we interact um, and serve each other. And so what Paul starts talking about here is he's talking about even though we're one body, we're different. Each one of us is different. It says, but grace was given to each one of us. So here he's saying, okay, yes, yes, we have everything in common. We have those seven things in common. But God's given us each a different gift a different spiritual gift. He's chosen to give us each a gift. Diversity is important. If we were all had one gift, then we'd be lopsided, right? We, we see in 1 Corinthians, it talks about the body of Christ, and one person's an ear, one person's a mouth, one person's a foot. There's differences um, in the gifts that God has given to each of us. And, and Paul here refers to a passage which is a little bit obscure, and I won't spend a lot of time in it, but he's referring back to Psalm 68. And here it's a, it's a Psalm of David where David is, is um, talking about God almost as if he's a, a conqueror. He's, he's been in a battle, he's, he's conquered, and he's brought back captives, though his enemies. And as the, the person that has been... Um, has conquered the enemy, it says he had received and then gave gifts to men. He, he distributed the, the bounty to um, the, those that were um, in the battle with him. And um, here it refers to the, what he's given to each one of us as the spiritual gifts um, that he has distributed to us. And that's kind of uh, the um, bounty from the battle that he's won. And specifically, he focuses on, on four giftings. He talks about the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the shepherds and teachers. And he says those are given to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Okay? First of all, when we see the word saints, it's not talking about a special class of really, really holy people within the church. Saints in the Bible is talking about people that are believers, that are followers of Christ. Everyone, all of us, if we have followed Christ, are considered to be saints. And also you'll notice that it says saints for the work of ministry. So not only are we all saints, as saints, we are all called to do ministry. Okay? Ministry is not for one person. It's not like I see on TV sometimes, on the news, they'll refer to a pastor and say he's the minister of the church. But in reality, we're all ministers. And these four groups of people are to equip us to do ministry. They're not there to do the ministry for us. They're there to equip us, to help us be prepared to do ministry. The apostles we've talked about it certainly includes the 12 apostles, um, likely includes the, the 72 apostles that were sent out. Apostle means 
uh, the one that's sent out, by the way. There are apostles of Christ that Jesus Christ himself sent out, including uh, the Apostle Paul, who Christ appeared to. But there also appear to be apostles that were sent out by the church. You can see that in um, Philippians 2, where Paul sends out, Paul talks about the church having sent Epaphrodites to him. I think in the uh, translations it often describes them as messengers, but it's the same word as apostles. So I know that some people would say this only refers to the apostles that Jesus Christ sent out. Others would say it refers to apostles that um, Christ sent out, plus the ones that the church sent out. Prophets, um, again, as I look at Scripture, those would be the people we see in the book of Acts, like Agabus, and also talks about uh, the daughters, I think, of Philip, that were prophetesses. And in the descriptions that we see, they were people that gave a word from God about what was going to happen in the future. We see evangelists. We see potentially these people are the ones that are equipping people to share the gospel. Not necessarily like the Billy Grahams of the world, but it could be people that are equipping people within the church on how to share their faith. Because this talks about these people equipping the saints. And as a matter of fact, on November 11th, we're going to have a, a group coming in on, on Saturday, and they're going to be um, doing a seminar from 8.30 to 3.30, talking about how you can share your faith with somebody, um, somebody else. Shepherds and teachers. I think in many translations, including the NIV, it says pastors and teachers. Um, and that's the only place that I think you'll find the word pastor or pastors in the New Testament. Um, in the ESV, if you do a word search for pastor or pastors, you won't find it any place. Okay, so, so much of the, the Christian world is like everything within a church revol revolves about one guy who's the pastor. But it's interesting, if you do that word search, you're not going to find that word in English. And even here, now they've eliminated that word, because pastor is basically the, the Latin translation of the word shepherd. And shepherd, I think, better communicates um, the role that somebody has that is overseeing a particular ministry. As we see in the New Testament, it talks about elders in a church. Their job is to shepherd. So in a sense, all of us that are elders are shepherds, or you could say we're all pastors, but we don't use that, that terminology. I think somebody the other day was visiting last week, and they, I had a, a guy staying with me, and he talked about Pastor Mike, and we all laughed. In, in a sense, I mean, I don't like to be referred to that as with that word, because I think it gives the, kind of the wrong connotation, but... I do have a responsibility as an elder to shepherd. And not only me, also if you're a community group leader, we have now started to use the terminology community group shepherd because we're communicating that there's a responsibility there for people that are in leadership. If you're heading a ministry, you're a shepherd. You're shepherding people. What does it mean to shepherd people? What does a shepherd do? Well, a shepherd feeds the sheep. Make sure they get fed. They lead the sheep. They protect the sheep from predators. And they also care for the sheep when they get injured. Those are the kind of things that those that are doing shepherding are responsible for. And like I said, part of the job is to feed. How do you feed people? Will you teach them? So I think that's perhaps why they, they, Paul puts shepherds and teachers together. Because people that are shepherding, a lot of what they have to do also is teach. And there's a goal for our unity. There's a goal that we have in using the gifts that God has given to us. What is that goal? Well, the goal is maturity. It says the purpose of all this, God has given each one a gift, it says, and he's preparing, providing people that can equip. It says for the building up the body of Christ to a mature manhood. The goal of us being given gifts is so that we, we can help each other as individuals and as a church mature. 
We coach people. We do it Sunday morning in preaching. It's done in community groups. Hopefully it's done in the ministries in which you're serving. And we keep pushing forward with the ultimate goal of attaining unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. We want to be united, but we don't want to eliminate the important things in the Christian faith in the process. <laughs> We're united in the faith. That means we have a common set of beliefs, which we will not sacrifice, in order to maintain the unity. We want to be united in a common faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God or who Jesus is as the Messiah, Son of God. That's the goal. And the reason we want to become mature is why. We want to become mature so we're not like a child. Children are easily influenced. Easily influenced. I'm, I'm very distressed when I see what's happening in my own country with parents who are persuading little boys and girls that they're born in the wrong body and they need to change their sex. The children are very easily influenced. Very easily. They don't know any better. And we need to be mature. We need to learn the scripture so that we can become mature and we can distinguish between right and wrong. It talks about here the, the person um, as a, ch a child is tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. There's a lot of people out there that are teaching false things that are not biblical. When I, when I see people on TV sometimes talking about the fact that if you become a Christian, you're going to become rich, I just, I cringe. <laughs> it's like if you read the Bible, you know that that's not the case. The Christian life is a life of, of where we, we need to be generous, we need to be giving, we need to be serving, not a life where we're accumulating things for our own comfort and needs. But there's a lot of people out there teaching that. And if we don't know the Word of God well enough, we're going to be easily swayed by this kind of false teaching. And we need to become mature. And part of the maturity process is learning from God's Word through people that are teaching in the church. Shepherds, teachers. This is a, a, from the book of Acts. This is where uh, Luke, who's writing the book of Acts, is talking about churches in two different cities. He's talking about this church in Berea, which is in northern Greece, and he's talking about another church in northern Greece in Thessalonica. And he's commending, he's speaking uh, well of the church in Berea because they've put a lot of focus on studying the scripture and validating what people taught to make sure it was in accordance with scripture. He says, now these Jews, those in Berea, were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Paul, who was doing the teaching, who's teaching that the, the Bereans were checking out, Paul was a good friend of Luke who wrote this. But he spoke highly of the Bereans for making sure that what Paul said was true. I don't think Paul was bothered if somebody challenged what he said. We, we as some of you know, a couple weeks ago, we, we spoke about the role of apostles and prophets. And some people came forward and said, I have some concern about what was taught, what was said. And we appreciate that. And we, have, we among the teaching team, we, we talked about it. Among the elders, we talked about it. We had a couple meetings. So we tried to clarify things. Okay? Our, our apostles for today, our prophets for today. You know, and we've, we've, through those discussions, I think we've helped to clarify our, our thinking on those issues. And that's good. Um, but I think, and we're going to be putting out a position paper, by the way, but we, we'd love to see all the, the gifts used today within this church. If they're used, they're to be used in a biblical way, we think. 
because there are out guidelines for the use of those gifts. But we want to be a church where we study the scripture, we can, we're discerning to know when somebody's teaching something that's not true or, or teaching something that's false. And through that process, we can uh, all grow together. And finally, Paul says, <clears throat> we're to speak the truth in love. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. Previously, he was using the, the metaphor of a family, how we're adopted into God's family, God is our Father. Now he's using a different metaphor. He's using the metaphor of the, the body, the physical body. And he says, we're, we as the church are the body of Christ, and Jesus is the head. And again, the purpose of speaking the truth and love to each other is so that we may become more mature. It says, as each part does its work. Again, the idea is that everybody in the body of Christ has, has a job to do, has something they're supposed to perform, has some ministry there to be involved in. As we've, we've used that um, illustration before, the churches, I think Hedra's used it, that we're more of a battleship than we are a cruise ship. Battleship, there's a role for everyone to play on the boat. There's nobody that's just sitting around as a passenger on a battleship. But a cruise ship, what happens, you give money to somebody and they're serving you. You can lay on the lounge. You can just enjoy yourself. You can be entertained. And I think for a lot of people, that's what church is. It's a place you, put, you come, put money in the offering plate, and you expect to receive services back for the money you give. You want good teaching, you want good music, you want a good Sunday school class, da 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 And you start, okay, that's not good, that's not good. That's not what the church is supposed to be. The church is supposed to be a place where we're all serving. And I have to say it's good, because I think in our church we have a lot of people serving in many, many ways. Many ways. In some cases, but very few cases, we compensate people because it, it takes so much of their time. But in most cases, many cases, uh, people are serving voluntarily without pay. Speaking the truth in love. Um, you may not be aware of it, but uh, we have a teaching team. There's uh, five or six of us that take turns teaching. And we have a teaching team meeting every week. So on Tuesday at 7 o'clock... What we do is we spend a half an hour or so reviewing the sermon from the Sunday before. So this Tuesday, they're going to be talking about my sermon. And two things. One is what you did well and how you can improve next time. Okay? And it's, it's good. People speak the truth. It's done in a very loving way. I have to bite my tongue. We all have to bite our tongue not to be defensive. But as we do that, week after week, we get better, hopefully. We improve. Because we have our weaknesses, we don't see our weaknesses. And it's not just with teaching. I think with the whole body of Christ, we need to be doing that. We need to be giving people truthful feedback to encourage them to become more like Christ, but do it in a loving way. So, in reflection, a couple of things. One is, would like to have us ask ourselves these questions. In regard to unity, am I making every effort to maintain unity in the church? Am I patient? Am I forbearing? Am I humble? Through diversity, am I using my God-given gifts to serve others? Do I even realize that God has given me a gift? And if I do, 
Am I using those gifts to serve other people? Or am I just <clears throat> sitting back enjoying, enjoying the cruise? Toward maturity, am I becoming more mature? If you look at your life over the last 10 years, have you become more like Christ or not? And if, if you haven't, maybe there's something wrong here because <laughs> we should be all growing to become more like Christ over time. And are you helping others to become more like Christ? Part of that would be using the gifts that you've been given. And then just as some suggestions in closing on ways to serve, we have a lot of ministries at JICF, perhaps many that you're not aware of. Um, I, I was going to go through many of what those are, but I don't think we have time. But you can go to the JICF website. We have one, by the way, in case you didn't know. Uh, www.jicf.org. And you can go through, and there's different, many different ministries um, that are listed there that you could potentially serve in. Maybe you pray about what ministry God would have you uh, be involved in. There are a couple ministries that we are involved in that aren't listed, like we don't list anything about the refugee work that we do because it's kind of a sensitive topic. But um, I think there are a lot of existing ministries that you could serve in. Another thing you can do besides explore is listen. Um, every Sunday, often there's needs that are posted here. Some that we've seen week after week because people aren't volunteering. The Rock, Frontline Ministry. Uh, we appreciate those that have come forward recently, um, but we need more people. Ask. If you're in a community group, maybe you ask your community group shepherd, hey, do you have any suggestions on how I can get involved? Or if you're a community group shepherd, maybe you can encourage people in the, your group to serve. You can go to them and say, hey, would, I think you should consider doing this. You should consider doing that. And then finally, consider. Explore and play, pray about starting a new ministry. We're going to have a presentation in a second from uh, Roshan, Roshan Learning Center, the Learning Center for Refugees. That learning center was started by a couple people that did just that. Heather Tomlinson, Ashley Berryhill. They saw refugees coming to the church. They saw that a lot of the children were not getting educated. They got together and said, I think the Lord's put it on our heart to start a, a school for refugees. And they did. And you'll hear more about that today. We'd like to encourage you to think that way. Don't just think of an idea and come to the elders. Hey, I think the church should do this. I think the church should do that. It's okay if you say that and then you say, and I'm willing to do it. <laughs> if you just say it, have an idea and come to us, and I think the church needs to find people that will do this, that's not going to be that helpful. But if you come and say, the Lord's put it on my heart to do something, and I want to help to get involved, that's great. And we, we would very much encourage that. God, God has given all of us the Holy Spirit. He's given us the uh, promptings in our heart in terms of what we want to be involved in, what we could be involved in. We can encourage each other, but in some cases we may just need to take the initiative and step up and do something. And we'd love to see that. If you want to do something, it would be good if you talk to the elders about it because maybe we can give you some direction and we can pray for you and maybe give you some suggestions on things to do or not do. But we, we're not a top-down church where all the ideas come from the elders and we tell everybody what to do. That's not, I don't think, the way the body was intended to be. Anyway, let's, let's uh, close in prayer. Father, we, we thank you that you've gifted each of us. I, I pray um, for our church that more and more people would step forward, use the gifts that you've given to them, that ultimately, through the exercise of those gifts, we become more and more united. And not only more and united, but become more mature as we learn your, your word and can spot
teaching that is not coming from you. Father, we want to be united, but we want to be united in the faith that you've given to us without compromise. In your son's name we pray. Amen.